different drop. Proud supporters of the Vincast have just updated their website. Uh, it's even easier now to find all the information and all the wines you might be uh, looking for. Uh, and you, what you're going to find uh, is lots of information about uh, small producers that they source from here in Australia using uh, a lot of the time authentic, uh, innovative and sustainable methods. And uh, a lot of the guests of the podcast, uh, if you look back on the back catalogue, um, you'll find their wines on Different Drop website. And no doubt, a number of the producers that Different Drop guys support will be on the podcast in the future. So one of the best ways you can actually support this podcast, which is uh, provided to you, of course, free of charge, is to support the guests for their um, generous time by going to the Different Drop website and buying some wines from some of the guests. So the best way to do it is to go to differentdrop.com forward slash intrepid wino. You'll find some secret products, some secret packs on there, including some of the Let's Taste packs. And when you make purchase, make sure to put in the code intrepid wino, one word, uh, and the guys at Different Drop will give you a 10% discount. So uh, thank you very much, Different Drop, for supporting this podcast and for supporting all those great Australian winemakers. On this episode of The Vincast, I chat with Dan Buckle, currently the winemaker at Domain Shindon Australia, but someone who's had extensive winemaking experience here in Australia and also makes some of his own wines under the Circe brand. Hello there, Vincasters, and welcome to another episode of the Vincast. My name is James Kersbrook, otherwise known as the Intrepid Wino. And uh, again, apologies for not having a, a fresh, brand new episode for you last week. I hope you enjoyed that kind of back vintage episode that I uh, did with James Dawson oh, almost two years ago now on uh, Tasting Grunewaldina. But I hope you, hopefully it gave you an idea where I got the idea for the Let's Taste YouTube uh, videos um, particularly the ones that I do live. Uh, and I've, if, if you've seen them, you would have known that uh, my first guest on the, uh, the Let's Taste Live videos was James, in fact, and we were looking at Australian Grenache wines, and hopefully he'll be on one in the future. But I do have one uh, coming up on the 28th of September, uh, starting at 6.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to be sitting down with a sommelier friend, and we're going to be looking at six Australian Riesling wines. Um, all pretty much, all, yeah, actually, all of them are from different regions around Australia. So uh, it's going to be really interesting to sort of see how uh, different winemakers express Riesling from different parts of the country. So uh, I definitely suggest uh, going onto the YouTube channel Intrepid Wino uh, and setting yourself a reminder for that tasting because I'd love to have you subscribe and uh, be on live and you can ask questions and make comments as well but uh, even better why not go to differentdrop.com forward slash intrepid wino and next week uh, buy yourself the let's taste riesling pack and you can actually taste along with myself and the guest uh, and you can participate and interact with us as we're tasting so hopefully you join us and hopefully you uh, will actually enjoy some of the previous episodes of let's taste that i've put onto the youtube channel so my guest for this week is uh, someone who kind of uh, I was aware of way back when I was working at Domain Chandon, well, I would have been about five, maybe six years ago. Uh, at the time, he was the winemaker for Mount Langi Giran, or Mount Langi Giran, I can never know um, how to pronounce that. Um, and his name is Dan Buckle. But um, interestingly enough, uh, after I left Domain Chandon, uh, he um, came on board as the chief winemaker and he's been there ever since. But he also makes some of his own wines under the Circe uh, name, uh, some Mornington Peninsula wines, which are uh, also getting a lot of attention. So uh, I, brought, I invited him on to chat about his background, his journey, uh, and how he came to be um, making some of the finest sparkling wines in Australia. Hope you enjoy the episode. If you uh, do, please uh, stick around to the end of the episode so you can find out how to get in contact with Dan and myself. But uh, until then, I'll see you on the other side. Dan, thank you very much for joining me today in the, the Vincast headquarters studio kind of thing. 
Um, and uh, you may be aware, uh, usually start every episode asking my guest what, if they remember their first interaction with wine, that kind of a light bulb went on above their head to sort of say, oh, this would be interesting to do. From a light bulb point of view, I, I guess I've, my dad uh, has long been a, a wine lover. We've, we've always had wine in the house. Um, I think tasting Pinot Noir with him, he had a vineyard in the 80s down Mornington Peninsula. Oh, really? Whereabouts? Uh, it's now Tux Ridge. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, and um, so tasting Pinot Noir uh, in my late teens, I think, was when the light bulb came on that this was something more than just a drink. So was your family in the wine industry or was that more like a hobby farm thing? Oh, it was a hobby thing? farm thing. Yeah, yeah okay. It was back in the 80s when it was taxed. <laughs> burial <laughs> yeah. place. Well, what, what did he do as far as uh, oh, he's profession? a doctor. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Doctors and lawyers are usually, you know, Mornington, exactly. Yarra Valley. Mm. Uh, are you from Melbourne originally? Yes, I'm born and raised here. Okay. And um, and so in tasting wine with your – was it your dad's wine or was it other ones? Uh, no, uh, Main Ridge Estate was the one I remember most <gasps> and Stonia. Yeah, of course. Uh, and both of those Pinots made a pretty big impression on me as being something – Half Acre Pinot is my favourite wine. Yeah, it, <laughs> one of my favourites still. So yeah, um, and but as as was that kind of you made me made you think, oh, that's something I could do as far as work. Like, were you working on with, uh, with on your dad's? Vineyard I, or I had uh, through the dad's vineyard connections. I had summer jobs working for viticultural contractors down at Mornington. Yeah, okay. And so that was through high school. The last few years of high school, I'd do that for a month or two over yeah, summer yeah. and. Bit of cash in hand. And that was cash. Yeah. And then I finished school and was traveling a bit. I did an arts degree at Melbourne Uni and oh, so did I. <laughs> working more and more in the restaurant world. Okay. To pay my bills and to pay for my traveling and so and gravitating increasingly towards the, the wine side of restaurant service. Mm-hmm. And um, and mates like at uni or at, you know, with, with the work, they kind of like drinking wine as well. You liked having wine with them? Um, to a certain extent, yeah, but it was mostly through the hospitality world that I got in, involved in some really nice wine. Sure. And then, um, eventually landed a job at Jimmy Watson's Wine Bar. Yeah, hey, there you at go. The, around the same time that I was finishing my arts degree. Uh-huh. And I'm close to uni. <laughs> yeah. And looking for what to do next. And, you know, I did not I did languages and classical studies and it doesn't really get you a job. And I didn't, What languages? Uh, Italian and French and hey. Latin. Nice. Okay. And romantics. Yeah. So I didn't want to be a teacher and um, didn't know what to do next and I didn't want a desk job. and so Didn't, I, didn't want to be a doctor like your dad? <laughs> well, I wasn't headed on that path at all. And so I guess um, I met Nicole, my wife, and at the time, and she said, oh, look, you really like this wine thing. Why don't you go to Wagga and just give it a go at, at wine science? If okay. you hate it, you can quit. And, and I, So I signed up to Charles Sturt Uni and... There you go. Never look back. It was yeah. great. Mm. What was the uh, what were your experiences like at, at, at Charles Sturt? You would have been boarding, of course, and and kind of with all the other you know wine making students. What what were you what, what were your what was life like in Wagga? It's a pretty quiet place. The the university, of course, full of different kinds of people. We had a really nice bunch of guys doing the wine science course who were full time there. I was I, I was there full time for two years, and we would. Um, get the best possible wine we could and get stuck into that in a fairly difficult environment for wine lovers. But Were you doing any work whilst you were studying? Oh, yeah, definitely. I kept my job at Jimmy Watson's. I used to drive down. had this Datsun 1600 on LPG. It cost yeah. me about 12 bucks a weekend to come down and keep working the hospitality job and you'd, see my you'd, girlfriend. You'd and, commute down for the weekend? Yeah, it's a four and a half hour drive. And I, said, oh, with, I thought it was you know, You're that. never really working... It's not starting early on Monday or finishing late on Friday, that kind of thing. So you yeah, can always true. find a hole. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And and so would you kind of bring bottles back up to uh, back up to uni and sort yeah, of open absolutely. Them up I was the guy who had to go shopping every week. <laughs> <laughs> where, where were you tending? Apart from at Jimmy Watson's, where were you tending to buy bottles from? Uh, it was practical to buy wine through the guys who, uh, particularly the Nelson Wine Company and um, King and Godfrey, of course. It's sure. A pretty good selection and sure. The Prince hadn't really got going at that stage. So. How did you get the connection with uh, with Nelson? Uh, they were supplying. Oh, of course, Jimmy with Jimmy Watson. Watson. Yeah, okay, fair enough. In particular, at the time, it was Lenswood Pinot that we were interested in because, again, this Pinot Noir idea was kept chasing it. And... Sure, sure. And and um, as far as the learning about winemaking, 
did you kind of really get into that sort of thing? What was there anything particular about you know studying winemaking or wine science that you really connected with? Uh yeah, I think I, I see false dichotomies everywhere in the world. And I think this idea that you can have a science brain and an art brain and not both is completely incorrect. Left I, brain, right brain kind of thing. Yeah, I think there's a lot of nonsense in that. And I think it's really interesting and part of my work to sort of bring those two ideas together. So do you think that it's also possible to like both the Beatles and the Rolling Stones equally? I don't know about equally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good point. But no, I think, yeah, there's a place for both and you can switch in. It's the same as trying to do a Sudoku and a crossword at the same time. It's quite difficult. But yeah. If you can zoom into one idea and then back out again. Sure. Mm. And, and as far as um, experience out and it was, was it just winemaking or were you doing some viticultural studies there's as well? There's a bit of viticulture as a part of that, but it's not the mainstream. So I do plant physiology and, and a few units of viticulture so you can talk the talk. Okay. Um, but mostly about wine science. Sure, yeah. sure. And and where was your first kind of experience as far as in the in the winery, in the cellar? Well, I, in first year, uh, landed a job for vintage at Stone Years because we had friends there. Yeah, and okay. Todd Dexter was... A friend of who I'd known, and I'd worked for them briefly over summer holidays. And of course, my sister taught Todd's daughters to ride horses, and so the, you know it's a small world. I had a month of working for Todd and just plunging Pinot and cleaning the press, and that, yeah, okay. that was really cool fun. Yeah, right. dog's body type stuff. Yeah, yeah. And um, out of interest, like was your dad was having wine made? At, yeah, at, on his vin. Who was who was doing that? Was he doing it? Uh, a guy called Hank at um, LG Park. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, and after a while, Dad sold the place because it became evident that there was way too much work involved in the vineyard <laughs> and no one was ever going to make any money. Um, and he made some okay wine and uh, he sold some Cabernet Merlot to someone in France. He thought that was a pretty good achievement. So Cabernet Merlot and Tux Ridge site. Yeah. Wow, that would have been interesting. Yeah. Well, Dad planted Cabernet Merlot because that was the 80s and that's what people were doing. That's what Gary Crittenden told him to do. And sure, sure. That was um, the idea that, you know, being a maritime environment and a cool climate that and Cabernet Just was... Just like Bordeaux. Yeah. <laughs> and Cabernet was the most widely selling red variety around. Yeah, of course. And, and very successful, so it seemed like the thing to do. And, yeah, I think you know, Dad made a couple of good wines, but they were pretty light-bodied and... He was fortunate that they weren't too herbal and green and weedy. Which mm. it, it was really Nat White who started playing around with Pinot Noir and learnt that that was a much more successful variety down there. Yeah, of course. Mm. I mean, and, and, and you know, Mornington, although it's a cool climate, it's pretty different to, to Burgundy, you know, like that, well, exactly. that maritime kind of in, environment. Yeah, it's absolutely. It's not at all like Burgundy. It's not continental and it's very much um, the heat. Of the day and the, it doesn't cool off quite the same at night and mm. the soils are totally different. So um, so that was your first sort of vintage experience. Where Did you work vintage in other places whilst you were studying? Or yeah, it? so the following year I, through the Jimmy Watson connection, had a job at Best Wines. There you vintage, go. Yeah, okay. Working with Viv and Simon Clayfield there and that sort of formed a lasting connection with the Grampians and, and some amazing history there. Mm. And the Thompson family are possibly the nicest people on the planet. Of course. Some of the most generous-hearted people you ever meet. And at the same time, I was <clears throat> um, I was friends with Emma from Bowen Estate, uh, Doug Bowen's daughter, Emma, studied with me. and Yeah, okay. So I'd been to visit her a few times and had this exposure to the generosity that the Australian wine industry can have. Yeah. And that was really what was the big hook to find, I suppose, a community of people who really take you in and, um, just people would open wines for you that were just crazy and it still goes on and I do it whenever I can for anyone who shows up at my place but this sort of spirit of sort of we're all in it together I think it's one of the great things about wine globally. Yeah. When they start opening up bottles you go oh no it's so unnecessary it's like no no it's very necessary we want to taste it too. Yeah yeah exactly and Doug was I remember at dinner at the Bones place one night and Doug's opening these bottles of Lange Barge and um, wow. Chateau Bichon Lalonde, and, and I'm thinking I've never seen anything like it, and I really wasn't a, a too au fait with what Bordeaux was, but here's, oh, we're well, having roast lamb. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna, were they know. old as well? No, they were good vintages from the 80s. And, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. that's reasonably old. But yeah, they, they were ready to go. Yeah, of course. Mm. 
So that was, yeah, that was good times. And um, what was the sort of the first move uh, once you've completed the, uh, the winemaking degree? So when I had finished full-time at Wagga, I went part-time for two years and uh, landed a job at Coldstream Hills. Yeah, okay, in the Yarra Valley. So I, I begged for a job in the vineyard after I finished uni and managed to con- convert that into a cellar hand job for vintage and managed, managed to stay on full-time for two years on the back of that. So why begging for you want? Did you want to get the vineyard experience, or did you just want to get a job? I wanted a job. You just wanted stop. a job, and sort of okay. Yeah, and Gotta I start somewhere. And I knew that, that I really wanted a job because that was uh, ninety seven, ninety eight, and James Halliday was still very involved, and mm. and so he hadn't he had, he'd sold it. At that he'd point? sold it. Okay, but he was still working from his office in the winery and tasting from his office in the winery and. Well, that, around all that, the time, so that is one of the perks of um, you know working at Coldstream Hills is you get the opportunity to sort of look at samples. Mm. Oh, exactly. So that was tremendous, and you know James has been a huge mentor for me and a really um, generous guy. Again, that generosity idea, but at a sort of spectacular level. And after work, we'd we'd help him tasting after work because that was back in the days of cork when opening fifty bottles was a proper kerfuffle. And, of course. Um, so we'd pour for him and do the stewarding thing and if you were quick enough you could taste as well and then every now and again there'd be a few pearls of wisdom and Mm -mm. and then for 95 percent of the wine we'd top up with something and put a cork back in it and and be free for all yeah of course it becomes but you would also also in tasting wines from all over australia you would have learned oh it's amazing tremendous amount yeah all of australia's wine goes through that door of course so you you know i'd never really tasted hunter semillons i no understanding of Margaret River and WA mm-hmm. wines and, and Claire Rieslings. I'd only just had a bit of a smattering of old ones that were in the Watson cellar, but things like that was, yeah, it's quite an education. Had you done much travelling to other wine regions in Australia at that point? At that time, no. I'd been to Coonawarra and Mornington and the Yarra, the obvious places to hit when you live in Melbourne. Yeah, of course. Um, but and then in 97, I landed a vintage in Bordeaux. Uh, uh, whereabouts? Oh, it's a crazy place. Um, this was because I had um, topped my year at uni and um, got this bursarship and the place called Chateau Cassin, the premier Côte de Bordeaux. Okay. It's not far from Cadillac. Right. And um, sort of in that nowhere zone between Sauternes and saint Emilion. Yeah, 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 of course. And uh, it had been purchased 15 years or 10 years beforehand by a Finnish guy, a guy called Juha Berglund, who had a um, big textile business in Finland, but also had the, the only Finnish language wine magazine. Was trying to be the Finnish decanter. Okay. And as as a writer, he'd come to Australia on a couple of occasions, and Finnish people like gadgets. They like the whole Nokia thing's no surprise. And Finnish people like technology. Sure. And um, so he'd seen Petaluma. And he'd seen some of the work ANG Engineering were doing with winery engineering, and he was tremendously impressed with that. And he when he bought his place in, at Chateau Carsin, decided that he'd get some Australians to come and refit his winery. <laughs> okay. And so he had Andrew Hardy and the guys from A&G and the influence from Petaluma on winery design. So there's this odd little Petaluma lookalike in the middle of Bordeaux, in sort of nowhere land in Bordeaux. And oh, funny. as a part of that, he installed Australian winemakers. And that's how I came through. Uh, first, Andrew, Andrew Hardy worked there for a bit and then Mandy Jones took over and Mandy had a strong connection with Charles Sturt, so she wanted to have students come from Australia to help her out every vintage. And it was crazy because they, um, they obviously, not, well, not obviously, but not surprisingly, they sell all their wine in Finland. Mm-hmm. And they would get um, a rotating group of Finnish hospitality students to come through to help out and basically shit kick for vintage. And they'd get too many of them because you could. Mm. Um, so the the guys from the hospitality school in Espo and Helsinki would come down and I was there for nine weeks because quite a long vintage. They make whites and reds and stickies. And, oh, okay. And it was just party house. Like the, along the liking gadgets, the Finns like drinking and partying. And it was I had, Scandinavians are massive drinkers. Oh yeah, and oh, it, right. so it was really good fun. And and Yuha was tremendously generous with that. No one got paid, but we all had a really good time. Yeah, yeah. It's not, a, it's, not, it's not the worst part of the world to be in. 
No, and so you take Sundays off. Lots of, lots of Lille, no doubt. Yeah, and no, I didn't drink any Lille. Oh, really? No. <laughs> I was so shocked when I, the first time I went to Bordeaux and I saw this big thing. I was like, oh, is this where Lille comes from? Mm. But we'd um, get some visits. Uh, I went to visit Chateau Margaux and Chateau mm. Palmer and, um, you know, we went to saint Emile whenever he could, which is... You've probably been there. It's such a pretty little place. Oh, it's one of the most the... beautiful wine villages in, yeah. in France for me. Go and have lunch there. And you went to visit a few estates and Chateau La Tour Blanche and places like that in Sauterne. So it's a good exposure to Bordeaux. Sure. Fairly broad. Sure, sure. Mm. Um, and so what, as far as uh, – that was before or after Coldstream Hills? Oh, that was during Coldstream Hills. During Coldstream Hills. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, – at that time, Yering Station was under construction. Right. And Tom Carson had been working at Coldstream, was still very friendly with the team at Coldstream. So Tom, I got to know Tom at that time and visiting him and watching Yering being constructed and sort of put my hand up for a job if there was one going. And so that's where I landed my first winemaker job, working sure. with Tom sure. um, from the end of 98. So made the jump across the valley then. Mm-hmm. And... um that sort of got me hooked into the Rathbone family's world. Yeah, of course. At a time when they were expanding quite a lot. And yeah. So that five years, during that time, I had a, a really good opportunity to go to Champagne and because of the Yarrabank lines. We yeah, DeVoe. Um, so I went and worked with the the, the DeVoe guys at Union au Bois. And yeah, of course. I did um, nearly three months there in 99. Wow. Yeah. So that was a pretty good adventure and learned quite a lot about Champagne at the time and got a chance to work on my French there quite seriously because I was living with the managing director's family and living in their house with their kids. And I'm how, a, how strong was your French before that? It was good and it was good enough to get by. And what, what Marie Gillet said to me what, you know, one of the first nights I was there, she says, look, your French is about 80% and you're getting by and people are understanding you and you can probably understand them, but no one's correcting you anymore because they can understand you, but you sound pretty funny and I'm going to correct you. So sorry about that. And yeah, she no, was that's really, good. That's helpful. It was great. It was really tough. It was, we don't say it like this. We sat like that sort of all through dinner. But in the end, I was... You remember though? Yeah. <laughs> In the end, I could watch TV and almost keep up with the news and you know, read books and stuff. So. But it was using the uh, the language uh, you know, yeah. studies from So from it turns out the arts degree was worth something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got one, you'll hear people put shit on it. But I think the arts degree was possibly the hardest of all my studies in terms of yeah. intellectual challenge. Yeah, Science is a bit more cut and dry. It's, sort of quite well, it's, it's right and wrong, basically. Yeah. <laughs> with arts, it's like, oh. Okay, you know, it's not wrong, but tell me why you think it's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so what were the, uh, what, what, what did you sort of most take out of that, that sort of champagne experience, the method traditionnel kind of, um, you know, that kind of thing? So, w- was, was the idea that you would come back with so much more experience to kind of feed into the Yering Station, yeah, and the Arabank kind and, of thing? Um, so, I got, pretty friendly with the team there and the guys who would come out to help with blending and help with tirage and got some exposure with that and because I could speak French. I was the, the guy at Yering who used to do the, that while I was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just the level of detail in tasting and then challenge that it is to taste what are basically unripe grapes and, mm-hmm. and really green, mean, young wines. Just and, looking at acidity. <laughs> yeah. And I think working like as I do now at Chandon, there's a sort of pattern recognition you need to know that this really tight mean acidic fresh young just fermented wine will in three four five years come out the other end in a certain way and yeah and how hard. the different base ones you know will combine together that kind mm. of thing it's very hard to catalog that it's quite hard to write it down of um, course uh so i think you just need some exposure to it and then the confidence that it's going to turn out okay um so that was a good education for me during that time. How long did you spend at Yering Station? Uh, five years. I was there from 99 through to 03 vintage. Okay. 03. That would have been fun. Pretty yeah, warm. Pretty warm. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting news for the Intrepid Wino. Uh, there's actually been a little partnership started by myself and Wine Companion. If you haven't heard of Wine Companion, you might have heard of James Halliday. 
uh, who started the Australian Wine Companion Guide about 30 years ago uh, in an effort to kind of catalogue uh, ratings on Australian wines and Australian wineries. Uh, but Wine Companion has evolved now to, uh, to not only include the guide, which is one of the biggest sort of releases every year, but also uh, on the website you can find a huge repository of uh, information about over 90,000 wines uh, from over 3,000 wineries around the country. But you can also uh, find lots of great information on the Wine Companion magazine, which has beautiful articles written by a number of different writers um, about Australian wines and also overseas wines. Now, as a special bonus to uh, Vincast, the Vincast uh, subscribers, you can actually get a 30% discount on any uh, subscription package with One Companion on the onecompanion.com.au website, uh, but you have to use the special code Intrepid30 at checkout. So, so make sure that you let uh, the guys know that you heard about this deal uh, via the Vincast, and uh, thank you, the One Companion, for your support of this podcast. Um, and you stayed? Did you stay within the Rathbone? Yeah. So it, at that stage of two thousand and two, the Rathbone family purchased Mount Langy Duran mm-hmm. from Trevor. From Trevor, and they kept Trevor on, um, but they wanted to put someone in to to learn from Trevor, and uh, so they offered the job to me. And at first, I said no. I had this really cool apartment in Carlton, and <laughs> had this really quite good job at Yering Station, and life was going well, and and Doug Rathbone rang me up and gave me the, I think you really should have a think about this opportunity discussion. And yeah. So it, I, I remember I drove out to, to Langy with Tom and you know, I don't know if you've been there, but when you drive in the gate at Mount Langy, you drive up this, you turn off the highway and it's about 7K, 7 or 8K up this road. I was really surprised that when I went there, I was like, well, that's really, it's a pretty far off the uh, the main road. It's yeah. best is like, it's on the road. Yeah. And 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 and, and Seppels, it's on the road, mm. so it's quite a turn off the road. But you drive up this sort of classic Australian tree lined road, and then turn the corner, and the mountain opens up, and there's a vineyard there. Mm. It's really spectacular. The place has a really strong presence. And just driving up the the driveway, and with the old vines on the left, I was thinking, you know, this could be a pretty interesting opportunity. Sure. And we tasted the O2 Langy Shiraz with Trevor then, and. And that's what sort of said, okay, I've got to, got to go through this door. It's wide open, a big chance to do something cool. So in 03, did you kind of do vintage? So I finished Yering vintage Station and Yering and then, and then moved to Langy after vintage and sort of coming into winter. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, did nine vintages there. And as, as far as kind of taking on, uh, you know, that kind of position, did you did you sort of feel that it was you know in part was like a you're a custodian of of the, the of Langy and the Langy Shiraz in particular and then kind of putting your own imprint on it as well? Yeah, very much so. Because when did Trevor pass away? Um, was it? Oh, I couldn't seven, eight, nine, something like that. Mm, might have been nine. Yeah, eight or nine. I yeah, f- I couldn't remember exactly. He. Because he had Alzheimer's, and so his involvement was diminishing. Sure, but that that custodian thing is quite real. You left, especially a place like Langy, and I think um, places where they have such a strong personality, that the sense of place in the wines you can make mm. is so prevalent. Um, your first thought is, I better not stuff it up. <laughs> and then the then the question sort of becomes, well, how can I get the most out of this place that has this wonderful sense of character about it and, yeah and what's next year's iteration going to give us and then uh yeah so that custodian idea is really quite a, you're not trying to make wines the way you want them you're trying to let the vineyard express itself to its best yeah of course mm. um but as far as some of the sort of slight changes that you might have made there as far as did they kind of change i made big changes yeah okay um, we stopped using American oak immediately. Trevor had had more influence than I had from South Australia. Uh, he, his time of making Shiraz was when the South Australian wines were huge, and mm. and so he, Barossa Kunawa, that kind of thing. So his oak ideas were coming from a different place to mine, and I was quite fixed in that. Um, so we got rid of the American oak. We, um, it got a little bit. I suppose anal retentive on hygiene. There'd been some Brettanomyces problems there, and I wasn't going to live with that. Yeah, I, I recently opened up the 98 
Cabernet Merlot, yeah. Langy, and, and so sort of go. started to see it. And I've got a bottle of 98 Langy Shiraz that I'm going to open up. Yeah, quite mostly soon. good, but it, there's a few that aren't. Yeah, well, yeah. I think I had half a dozen of each of those, and, and, and there kind of was a little bit of variation from bottle to mm. bottle. So we weren't going to have any of that anymore. Right. We moved to screw caps pretty swiftly in 04. Um, I have a bottle of that too. So that was a good thing. Um, and then from about 05, I started using my ideas with Pinot Noir in dabbling with Shiraz mm-hmm. uh, with whole bunches. And mm-hmm. 2006, I had a very significant trip to Japan where I met a bunch of guys there, in particular this one chef, sommelier, who gave me a bit of a talking to about making wines that were too big. Right. Yeah. And he, his his point was, and he made it very, very well in a Japanese way, that, you know, it doesn't have to be big to be beautiful and things can be small and exquisitely detailed and mm-hmm. perfectly made. And, mm-hmm. and it, it can be expressive without being massive. Yeah. And so that sort of resonated with me and it took that idea back. And from the 07 vintage forward where it stopped, and this had been on the back of several trips to the UK where uh, consumers and trade were forever complaining about wines being over 14.5% alcohol. Mm. And that, that's sort of fair enough. And, you know, when I remember one hilarious time I was standing behind a trade table and this guy comes up and says, 14 and a half, I can't drink a whole bottle of that. I thought, well, why are you drinking a whole <laughs> bottle of wine? <laughs> that's not the idea. I mean, you don't drink a whole bottle of whiskey and complain about its alcohol. Yeah, the you? idea is you share it. Yeah. <laughs> so that, but um, <clears throat> I suppose looking to make something a bit more medium bodied and um, now that that idea is still there, sort of, I, I guess if you're sharing a bottle of wine with your mates, it's it's a much nicer experience to finish it and feel a little sense of disappointment that it's gone, rather mm. than finish it and be going, "Yeah, we did it. We got you know, we got there." So um, wine should be delicious and Moorish, and and uh, and I think it's about can, the journey, not the destination. Yeah, it's a cliche, but. Um, well, I, I remember that, like, I think it was the first time, well, the, the only time I've actually been to Merlingi was uh, driving across to Adelaide for, for my studies when I was doing the, the Masters of Wine Business going out for residential school. And that would have been in 2008. And I think at that point, the 06 was, was, was the Langi Shiraz that was on release. And I was, you know, quite blown away. You know, I, I suppose I'd seen at that point more, kind of Heathkit Shiraz Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and I didn't kind of understand how different Grampians Shiraz could be. I kind of didn't think of the Grampians as like, I thought it was more, you know, Pinot Noir and I don't know, for some Mm -hmm. some reason I just thought of it, Grampians, higher elevation, cool climate, you know, I I, I still knew so little about Shiraz. I don't think I knew about the Northern Rhone, for example, at that point. Oh, at least you got that elevation and coolness idea because many people sort of smudge Grampians, Pyrenees, Bendigo into one sort of general yeah. central Victoria idea. Yeah, and, and possibly that, you know, that might have been a reflection of how Shiraz used to be made in that area. Mm. Even though it was coming from a cooler climate, it was still pretty massive, you know, and you could you could still get ripeness, and but then with a lot of oak and that, and that kind of thing, mm. um, they probably looked a lot more massive and so it was probably a good thing to kind of bring it back a little bit and, and, you know, have the opportunity to be able to express Shiraz in that sort of more lighter and lithe way yeah. whilst still being expressive. Yeah. I mean, it's a cool climate at, in the sense that the heat summation at Mount Langy looks like Launceston. Wow. Okay. And it's 350 metres elevation. Mm-hmm. So, and it faces east, so it doesn't get that hot baking afternoon. So in that sense, but in every other sense, the summers are relatively hot and you can have really fiercely hot days in February, March. And with relatively low rainfall, you can let the wine, the grapes hang for quite a long time. So, mm. but it, would, it would get pretty cold at night. It gets pretty cold at night and, and it's possible to make quite vegetal wines if you get the harvest timing wrong so that uh, if you don't get to a certain level of ripeness, they come up with a sort of a what I call a parsnip, kind of parsley celery kind of flavor Mm -hmm. and that's quite unpleasant at a very low level that can be interestingly savory Mm -hmm. and with time it does and you see this in northern Rhone wines that are overcropped particularly from Crow's Hermitage Um, so you're concerned about greenness and then 
overshoot is the problem and then you end up with something that's a bit porty and overdone. Mm. And where do you want to find that sweet middle ground, I suppose? And, sure. Yeah. So how how did you find did did people kind of see this different expression of of Langy and you know, did they kind of what was the feedback like? It was a pretty good ride. Um I had some excellent feedback. People were concerned at first. Um Doug Rathbone gave me a pretty stern don't fuck it up talk. Yeah. Uh uh, but uh, the 04 release went really well. We had some excellent accolades. The 05 release had a string of trophies. It was a real career highlight for me. We had a heap of trophies for the 05 Langy Shiraz. It, was there a Jimmy Watson in there at no. some point? No, okay. We went close with the 09. Yeah. And so we had all the right sort of supporting pieces, I suppose, that helped the trade and consumers understand that things yeah. were okay. Yeah. And Trevor was there for the first few years um, supporting us as well. So the sense of transition was really strong mm-hmm. at what point did the uh the Cersei story begin uh because that was whilst you were still at Langy. yeah so we started that at the end of 2009 um wanting to return back to making some some pinot we had a little patch of pinot in the grampians but it wasn't much and i wanting to get back to mornington as well mm-hmm. so and when you say we we oh, so it's a partnership with a guy Aaron Drummond. Yes, who's a, a mate of mine. Okay, we both we didn't know each other, but we grew up in Mornington Peninsula. Right, and um, he has a marketing background, so uh, I'd always been forewarned about wine businesses because of the sales problem. It's quite easy to make wine, it's quite easy to grow grapes and make wine, but selling wine is and getting the brand piece right is a quite difficult challenge. Of course. So that gave me some confidence. So, yeah, that was at the end of 2009 and we decided to lease a little vineyard. We we knew we needed to have full control of the viticulture and we didn't want to be at the mercy of the market buying grapes and we didn't have anything close to enough money to buy anything or plant grapes. Mornington would have been pretty challenging as well. Yeah, well, since then Aaron's bought some land and built a house and planted a few acres. And oh, we'll, okay. we'll see some grapes next year, all being well. Hmm. Um, so where are, we, where are we getting the fruit from? So we have a little vineyard that uh, on Hillcrest Road. It's As the crow flies, it's halfway between Tux Ridge and Paringa Estate. Oh, okay. So it's very familiar territory. Yeah, very. Um, it's a nice little three-acre block. Um, quite simple viticulture. It's yep. half Pinot, half Chardonnay, and um, we manage it to a pretty low crop and fairly meticulously. It's nice. It's sort of like a just a bit bigger than a garden. You can really keep an eye on everything. So initially it was just Pinot Noir or is it still just Pinot Noir? Uh, no, now we do Chardonnay in two forms. We make a tiny bit of Blanc de Blanc and still wine Chardonnay. Mm-hmm. And just this year we released a Shiraz as well. From Mornington. Oh, wow. Okay. How, how's that looking? Oh, it's good. It's, sort of, it's interesting. It picks up a bit on what I left at Mount Langy with this whole bunch story because it, I guess the, one of the lessons at Langy was that it's quite easy to make fruity red booze with Shiraz, mm-hmm. uh, but it's something, and it, you know, Australia is largely in love with Shiraz because you can make reliable fruity red booze with Shiraz, mm-hmm. whether you're putting that in a box or a bottle. But uh, when you're getting into really exciting Shiraz wines, for me, that's when it's about, spice and pepperiness or savouriness or yeah. florals. Yeah. And so the Mornington Shiraz we make now is about those sort of facets, I suppose, savouriness and florals that, that make the wine really compelling for me. I, you know, you're taught to taste with respect to palate, but I think we can't overlook aroma in wine. And when you smell a wine, if you really fall into the glass and just think, oh, my God, I love that. It's mm. the sort of red wines that I try to make. Mm. Yeah, the other thing that I think gets missed out on is, is feel, is texture. Yeah. And there's not enough sort of consideration for texture in Australian wine. Yeah, oh, for sure. And so we think about tannins in a fairly pragmatic way, but that whole slipperiness and roundness and where it sits in your mouth and and how it feels texturally to swallow the wine and all of those elements are really important. Yeah. Um, and that goes to the pleasure factor. Coming back to, you know, I mentioned Jimmy Watson. Did you have the opportunity to sort of do much uh, show judging? Yeah, I still do. Um, although at times I'm sort of questioning the whole show process. There's a lot of, uh, yeah, 
uncertainty about whether it, what role it plays in our industry, I suppose, and whether mm. it's you, I Some, guess, and there are people who are, I think now are questioning the amount of different shows there are. Well, that's right, and the commercial relevance of the shows for the for the sh- well for the show itself, um, which can be quite a money spinner and it attracts a lot of criticism because the entry fees and everything else are part of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also for the exhibitors and what relevance it has for consumers. And, sure, sure. And whether you can be truly objective about tasting wine anyway. <laughs> whether a panel of three people can get to any sort of meaningful conclusions. Yeah. But <clears throat> for me, I, I enjoy judging at shows. It's As an immersion in wine tasting, it's a great experience to sort of tweak your palate a little bit. In the same way that would have been like tasting with James Halliday when he was, you know, looking at yeah. submissions for the Wine Companion. Yeah, as a way to taste a lot of wine in one hit. It's a yeah. really good way to do it. And, and it's sort of a community sort of involvement thing for me. Like yesterday I was judging at Gippsland Wine Show. Okay. And, you know, that's a small show and it's a relatively small region and a lot of volunteering going on to make that all happen. But it's for the benefit of the region and the exhibitors and that, that's a really good thing. Which which is the original idea of a wine show, is it not? Yeah, exactly. So the betterment of the breed, helping people get some healthy feedback in a, from a blind tasting and to have a little bit of competition and get everyone together and yeah. be happy is... What goes on, um, similarly, I'm involved in the Adelaide Hills Wine Show and that's a wonderful thing for the, on the same level that the, the Adelaide Hills whole region comes together mm. and they get amongst it and help support the show happening and then they have a big award ceremony and then everyone goes to the pub and it's all tremendously social. It's just as it should be. The way it should be, absolutely. Mm. So um, what kind of drew you to Domain Chandon? Well, I've been... Living in Ararat and we've had my son Leo was born in 07 and then I had uh, twin girls 18 months later. Mm -hmm. And there's there's not a lot of family support for us in Ararat, obviously, being Melbourne-based originally. So um, we'd always kept a flat here in the inner city and so I was doing a lot of driving and Nicole pretty much decamped back to Melbourne to be closer to the grandma team. Mm -hmm. And... um, I was sort of getting a bit burnt out by the, the tyranny of distance. It wasn't like back when you were at Charles Sturt and you no. drive down every week and it's like, oh, this is no, a bit No, because I had hassle. this really busy job as well. <laughs> I wasn't just a student. <clears throat> so, yeah, the, I started looking around for what might be my next move and and the job at Chandon came up and I thought that would be a really interesting challenge and I do like, you know, I've always loved sparkling and champagne and to work for a larger organisation and see what that's like would be interesting and so when, to learn. when you were appointed, um, I think I think their job was actually advertised just as I was actually leaving, you know, because I worked in, right. in the marketing department. And then when you were actually appointed, I I, I actually didn't know about the experience at Yering Station and, and, and obviously with Yarra Bank. And so I sort of thought, oh, he's coming from Lange, Mount Lange Grant, like, what, you know, is he, how is he going to kind of adjust to, you know, working at Chandon with, you know, looking at so many base wines and stuff like that. But now that I know that <laughs> you had that experience and you went to Champagne, so I was like, oh, of course, it makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah, well, I, it was true. And I, on the flip side, it, uh, one of the problems with working at Mount Lange, if there were any problems, would have been that I was, felt like I was getting pigeonholed as a Shiraz guy. Sure, of course. And um, my interest in wine are much, much wider than that. Mm-hmm. That wasn't getting any satisfaction there. Or, um, Cersei was just starting to take off. Just starting to take off at that time. Yeah. Mm. And 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 you've been at Shandon for a few years now. You've enjoyed that yeah. experience. Yeah, coming up on four years, and it, it's been great. I'm enjoying it more now than than I was at the start. There was a bit of adaptation, I suppose. Yeah. Working with a larger team and understanding the the flow of a place that works quite differently. Sure. Um, but I'm very lucky. I have a lot of freedom in my role. Yeah. And you know, it, you would think being owned by Moet Hennessy that we, we would be subject to the will of the overlord from France, but it's not like that one little bit. We, we have a really collaborative relationship with the guys in France, but they don't tell us what to do. They, yeah. Um, the wines that we make are the wines that we want to make. And sure, sure. But, you know, you've got plenty of support both, if, you know, out of France and also internally at, at the winery. Yeah, exactly. So... Uh, We've got some really long-term employees at Chandon who really know the place well and where all the bodies are buried. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and we've got 
a really strong connection with the guys at Moet. Of course. Um, I'm particularly friendly with some of the guys in the R&D team at Moet and they're, they're yeah, a great sure. resource. They, they've just got a wealth of knowledge and curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, you know, surprisingly not very French in their style. I suppose it's generational too, but they're not opinionated. They're, they're hungry to learn and they're willing to share. It's a, it's a great thing. But in the same way that, you know, um, Australian, young Australians have sort of traveled and they kind of got experience over in Europe and kind of thought about, you know, translating that into the Australian kind of um, way of doing particularly wine. They're doing the same thing. Like the, you know, the Europeans are going and, and, and sort of working vintages or, you know, doing internships. You know, when I worked at Chandon, we had, I think at that time, four interns, you know, out yeah. of France who were there for 16 months to kind of get, get experience, you know, working in another country. Yeah. And then, and, and kind of how, how that can help them, particularly in that kind of global mindset. You mm. know, I think that's fantastic. Yeah. I've, I've seen this in its most acute form in Burgundy. Um, I worked in 2001 at Domain Conferent Cotetido in Vaughan and the generational gap between Jackie Conferent and, and his son Eve mm. was dramatic. And because Jackie's quite old at the time, and I remember my first day, I went, you know, put on my blundstones and got up and went down into the cellar and said to Monsieur Conferent, "What can I do to help you?" And he says, "He's there racking barrels in his late sixties um, by gravity and." It's hard work. Mm. And he looks at me and says, look, in my opinion, you're an Australian spy. <laughs> and in any case, I've been doing this job for 60, 60 years. So what do you think you can do to help me? And I'm standing there just completely gobsmacked and thinking, did, did he really say that? Think questioning my translation. And fortunately, Eve came down the stairs at that moment and he'd heard the last snippet of it and says, come with me. Dad's a grumpy bastard. Come on. And so I just followed Eve around for the, Six weeks I was there and stayed out of Jackie's way. And sure. Where Eve had, the contact that I had had to get that job was through Eve because he wanted to come to the Aravallian. Right. See what we do. Yeah. Because he already had this much more global perspective on the wine industry and much more open-minded. Yeah, of course. And here we are sort of 14 years later and it's the ground's moved again. The internet's a whole new thing. and Yeah, of course. Um, so, yeah, the, it's nice travelling in France and talking to wine people and particularly because from the – a Champ and Wise point of view, Australia's paradise, both economically and climatically and in terms of freedom. Of, you it's know. like, wait, we can take fruit from any number of regions? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do what you like in the, in the winery. Like, yeah. So it feels like a free-for-all for them. We explain the, the, the Australian winemaking law and its fairly simplistic structure. Yeah. And they can't believe that that could be the whole story. We, we, we just assumed it had to be com complicated. <laughs> Exactly. So from an innovation point of view, they, their eyes are wide open and that's that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously at, at Chandon and possibly at Lange, you know, you, you have sort of young, you know, winemaking graduates sort of from, from all over the world, you know, coming mm. in and bringing in their kind of different sort of philosophies yeah, and all stories. The time. And, and so you, it's very collaborative. Yeah. And you look for that when you're looking for a vintage team, you want a collection of good local people and interesting, vibrant, dynamic people who come from far away who want to do a lot of cleaning and have some ideas. So. Drive a forklift? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so um, tell me, like, you're returning to Champagne quite soon because you Yeah, I'm a, going a, in October. A, a, for lovely, a lovely prize. Was it last year or the year before? Oh, that was in 2012, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I had the good fortune to win the the... Van de Champagne yes. Awards. Yeah. And um yeah, this year it's going through the Mo Tennessee world. Right, okay. Um this is the first time we've done it, but all the different Chandon wineries around the world are winemakers are going oh, together cool. for a technical catch up for a few days and including Dimension on India. Yes. Including the guys from India. Wow. So that'll be um that'll be really good. I'm looking forward to that. I haven't met everyone in that team. So. Sure, sure. Mm. Well, that will be fun. I remember like, you know, when I was at Shandong and they had like, you know, conferences and stuff like that. It was this really fantastic atmosphere, you know, that real collaborative kind of sharing mm. different kind of things, you know, when, you, when you're all coming together. But uh, you are, I'm sure, very, very busy. So I definitely appreciate you making some time um, in the lead up to you going away to be on the Vincast. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, and as far as um, the Cersei stuff, 
people can there's a website there's a website we've uh i think we've managed to wrangle the website so you can buy stuff on it now. wow um but we're fairly well distributed in melbourne and sydney now mm-hmm. um number of good restaurants have our wines great and the, the website address is just circe.com.au circewines.com.au c-i-r-c-e yeah uh, and people can follow yourself on social media. Yeah, I have a Twitter account at, at Dan Buckle. Yep. And um, Instagram. And Instagram, um, Dan Buckle Wine. Oh, excellent. Mm-hmm. But uh, definitely, guys, uh, have some Shandon wines, you know, particularly because I used to work there. So you should definitely be supporting Shandon uh, and, and go and buy some Cersei wines as well. And, uh, and thank you to Dan for being on the show. Okay. Cheers, James. And as always, thank you very much for listening to another episode of The Vincast. I have been James Scarcebrook, otherwise known as The Intrepid Wino. And of course, you can follow me on uh, Instagram and Twitter at Intrepid Wino and also the podcast on Twitter at The Vincast. Uh, if you go to facebook.com forward slash Intrepid Wino, you'll find my Facebook page. And don't forget, you can subscribe to the Intrepid Wino channel on YouTube uh, to find lots of videos, including all of my Let's Taste videos. Uh, if you go to, well, if you want to subscribe to the podcast, uh, you can go to the iTunes store or the podcast app on your iPhone, uh, also Stitcher, Player FM, uh, and subscribe to the podcast so that you can actually get the latest episode uh, downloaded as soon as it comes out. If you do subscribe to the podcast, I really, really do appreciate people leaving a rating and review because uh, not only does it let me have, you know, have some feedback about the podcast, about what you enjoy and what you might want to hear more about, but also it's a, a great way to uh, encourage uh, more listeners, but also potential guests to be on the podcast. When they see people sort of talking, you know, saying nice things about the podcast and why they enjoy it, then it, it's uh, even more reason for them to actually be on the show. Uh, now, of course, you can find all that information on my website, intrepidwino.com, uh, including lots of different writings I've done in the past. And uh, it's a, you know, please send me an email at thevincast at gmail.com and provide me with, uh, with a bit of feedback. But uh, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, until next time, bye.